Public APIs are eating the world. Having well-designed and easy-to-use APIs is not enough. How do you make sure you, are, you can outplay the competition? That's why I'm going to try to answer this presentation. My name is Anthony. I'm a developer advocate at Amadeus. Amadeus is the biggest IT provider for the travel industry. And within Amadeus, I work on our open API program, Amadeus on Developers. We provide access to travel data and services, so basically APIs, to any developers in the world. And thanks to my last years of experience, I'm going to give you eight things you should do and you need to do to have a rocking API product. You ready? So let's go for the first one. <coughs> Openness. And I'm going to talk a lot about being open and transparent with your users. No one has time to invest time or money in something that they are not sure they can bring value to them. No one. So every barrier you have between your user and your product to discover what you do and the value you can bring to them will make you lose customers, potential customers. You need to open as much as possible, and I will even say everything about your documentation. No need to create an account. They should be able to come, discover what you do, and the value you can bring to them without losing time. Open documentation, open everything. Functional, technical, API reference, examples. Everything should be easy to access and fast to access. And the second part that links to that is the transparency about your pricing. If a potential customer, a new user, needs to contact you to understand how much it might cost him or her to use your product, you're already losing potential customers. Be transparent, clear about your pricing. The other thing is the status page. What you're trying to do is to build a trusted relationship between your users and your product and your company. I think a status page brings two things. The first one is you're saying to the world, to all your customers, that you're going to be honest with them. They can follow blindly the status of the page, of the product. So the status page is actually very simple. It's a red and green light that is saying my API is up and running or is down. So it's really being honest with your customers when you have a problem. And the second thing is actually very good for you. It's going to reduce the amount of support you might have. I'm a developer, and as developers, we tend to think when something goes wrong when we develop, that's actually the product which is done, and not us doing a mistake. This is a lot of developers to check what is the status of the product and to see that it's actually a mistake they did when developing, instead of sending you a lot of support requests. And it's quite easy to put in place. And the next one is all the terms and conditions. I have to start by saying lawyers are humans too. But they tend to speak and to write their own specific language so that make it impossible to understand for, let's say, normal people. You need to protect your company. You need to define the rules. So you need legal terms and conditions. But what's the point to define rules if the other players cannot understand them? So what I would advise is to have two versions of the terms and conditions. The first one, the complete one, that will actually cover you from a legal point of view and explain very details to the users what are the rules of the game. With the other one, that's actually agreement readable. Shorter version, if you're going to invent some jokes, but that actually people can read. And that's how you can encourage your customers, your users, to read them. Because it's important for them as well that they understand the rules of the game to not make mistakes when they build the solution on top of your product. So clear and easy to read, terms and conditions. Second one, documentation. It's good because we have API docs. <laughs> documentation is what takes your users from zero to be hero about your product. From knowing nothing about your product or the company to actually build their business on top of it. And for that, you have very different type of documentation that will drive them all the way from the beginning to being experts or even champions about the product. The first one is the exploration guide. Exploration Guide is an interactive documentation that allows the users to, without knowing what you do, in less than a minute, to understand what is your core business. I really like the Twilio example. You don't need to know what Twilio does. You can actually just enter, invite you to enter the phone number, to click on the orange button, and in a couple of seconds, you're going to receive a message on your phone. 
It's a communication company, very easy to understand, very quickly. And you can see that in 10 lines of code, you're able to do that. I'm going to talk about next thing about it. It's so the look. <laughs> so a question left. Less than a minute to understand, interactive, to show the core business of the company. Then we get started. Basically, when you have a new user, what you want to do, what you should do, is to take the hand of that person and to bring him or her all the way from not knowing anything to the end. A user should never feel lost. The feeling of being lost is either hating the product or is you so frustrated because you feel stupid. So you have to make sure that all the way where you discover and build on top of the product, you have to be grab the hands and bring them on a the step. That's part of the quick start idea or the get started. It's the one, two, three. Create your account, get your API key, do your first click call. So you never feel lost when you use the product. That will be short, clear, but make sure they know exactly what they have to do. Then guides and tutorials. You can write guides and tutorials for everything which is functional, industry, technical, to make sure that they can dive in more in details about specific parts. Technical, it can be your authorization guide. How do I get my access to account? Or it can be pagination. How do you manage pagination, error handling, and so on in your details? Industry, I work in the travel industry. It's quite a complex industry, so you can explain how the industry works. So when they do not talk about the product, they understand how the industry works, because most of the time they are not expert. And tutorials, you can take a specific framework, a specific language, and you show them how you can integrate your product very easily, step by step, following these tutorials. And then the reference documentation. This is really the detailed technical documentation about your product. So that's where, if a user arrives here, most probably is ready to start building something. So I'm not going to talk about it has to be consistent, your API has to be very well designed, that's basic. But your reference documentation needs to be interactive. You should allow your users to use your API without writing a single line of code. They should be able to come to your portal and use your API directly. So here, it's a travel API, they can input the origin, the destination, departure date, return date. They can actually execute the API and get a real response, so we can discover without wasting time to install a framework and so on. Because at that point, we are not 100% sure they want to invest in the product. The reference documentation should have an example, at least, which is executable from the portal, which, is, which works in any context. For us, the example has to be working for any type of countries in the world, or any cities, because we don't know if it's going to be someone from Spain, someone from UK, or someone from Japan. They should be easy to copy and pass. Put this copy button. It's very simple to implement, but it will make the life of the developer much easier. And always up to date. They have to work. If you have an example that doesn't work, they will feel that either the documentation is updated and you do not take care of your product, or either you have a bug with your backend. Third point, on board. Everything I talked before is actually part of the onboarding process. But I wanted to add a couple of points. And the first is, once again, no one has time or money to invest in something they are not sure is going to actually bring value to them. No one wants to answer 15 or 20 questions to create an account. No one wants to give you a lot of personal information just to see what you have to offer. So make the sign of process extremely <coughs> easy and fast. It should, take, it should take less than a minute. An email, maybe, a captcha, and that's all. So you're going to tell me, yes, but I need to know what, where my user is, what they do with my product. You feel worried of not knowing that. Here, it's not the right time. Yes, you need to know this information, but do you prefer to have one user, one user and know everything about him or her, or have 10 users where you might discover other information later? I will go for the second solution. Make the creation of the account fast, easy. And then later on in the process, maybe when they try to access your real product and they're ready to pay, that's where you can ask many more questions. Because if they're ready to pay, they're ready to answer 15 questions. But not before. Email validation. Yes, we need to validate the email. Yes, we are worried about bots. 
but if you use credit, you create your account, you go to validate your email, you come back to the portal, you can do that later. Let them create the account, validate the email when it actually matters. Most of the time when they need to access to the product that they're going to pay for. Before, I'm not sure it's that important. Automatically login in, first time created, same thing. We create the account, don't make them go to the see email, come back and tap again the credentials. We create the account, they are automatically logged in on the portal, and you already created the first application. They already have access to the first API credentials, so they can start using much quicker. It's the same, simple, fast, remove all the barriers to make sure they stay. Otherwise, we can see population. I really like the uh, welcoming emails that they send uh, through you. To me, companies are doing that very well. So after you're creating your account, they send you an email. But it doesn't feel like it's as a developer, it doesn't feel like it's spam. They're actually sending you meaningful information that will help you to understand the product. The top of it is to get access to your credentials. The second part is what we were talking about before, the one, two, three. The next part are uh, important links to their API documentation or other things. And if you look at the vocabulary, don't worry, don't worry. This is where they grab the hand and make sure you're not lost. I'm here. I'm going to take you to every step to make sure you don't feel lost. The last part, I'm going to come back to it a bit later. It's more the inspiration part. See what other of our customers are building for your product. You can get some inspiration there. And the last one, if you need a quick demo, you can contact their evangelist. That's the type of communication you can send because you bring meaningful information at the right time to your customer. And I'm going to share with you my personal rule of three. What I try to apply when I do the product. Three seconds to understand your API. 30 seconds to create the account. Three minutes to do your first API call. Easy to remember. But if you manage to do that, you will make sure that your customers, or most of them, will go at least until they can trade the API. And this is possible only if you follow everything I said before. Getting close up to the food control. Examples and demos. So now they know what you do. They play a bit with your API, and that's the moment they're going to start evolving. And you still need to help them. So the first part is about team applications. It's the same. As starting as a, when, as a developer, when you start developing, if you need to start from scratch, you have a feeling that it's going to take a lot of time. You need to have the right framework, you need to, to do the right configuration. It doesn't seem very appealing. If you're able to give them templates or examples that they can actually download and directly start developing inside, it's going to make their life much easier. So that's what you do with having a list of demo applications, public, open source if possible. And actually, I very like uh, doing the first presentation when saying the application should be automatically deployable to test them as well. Do it. Different languages, different frameworks. If you want to do, uh, you know your product is used by many mobile developers, they can download your Android sample, see how they how to use your APIs directly in Android, and they can update it themselves from scratch. The gallery. This one is really see it as a win-win situation. First, it's a win for you. You're exposing what your existing customers are doing, and you're exposing success stories, and people love success stories. So you can inspire people by showing what your customers are building with your products. And the other main situation is actually for your users. Firstly, you recognize their work. You put on your portal their solution. Secondly, is actually promoting the solution. So they're going to be happy about it. So it's really a win-win situation. Very quickly on this one, still the same. Provide code samples in many languages if possible. You have to segment your, your audience, your users. You have to know what are the most used languages by your developers to provide them code samples and SDKs. And that's the next point. There is two types of persons. And you can meet them at many API conferences. The first one is the pro code generation. We are software developers. We are here to automate everything. Why will I write SDKs manually? I will never be able to support all the languages. So that's a waste of time and a waste of energy. Now, with open specification, we cannot automate absolutely everything. Fair enough. The second one is the, I want to bring the highest quality possible for my SDK. 
I want to have the full control of documentation and the design of my SDKs. So I will never generate code. It's a bad point. What if you could make the best of both worlds? Understand your developers, understand your audience, find what are the most used programming languages, and develop manu manually develop SDKs for them. Have an amazing documentation, a lot of examples. But make sure your API documentation is well written so the other developers not using those languages can actually generate that code from the specification. That's not powerful. Six, free trial. <coughs> Who will buy a car without testing it, without test driving it? <coughs> Who will pay to test drive a car before buying it? No one. It's the same as your APIs. Let your users test your APIs for free before deciding if they actually want to pay. And that's where you can tell me, yeah, but what's going to happen if I steal my data? Or how do I protect my data that to be stolen? So maybe you can create a different environment and you have a lot of mechanisms to actually protect your data. The first obvious one is the copper. Limit in the free trial environment the number of calls you offer to each developers. But then you can tell me they can create as much account as they want because I said before that it should take less than 30 seconds to create an account. So maybe in this free trial, in this test environment, you can limit the set of data you offer to them. We have an API offering points of interest in all cities in the world. We still want developers to be able to test it before deciding they're going to pay for it. But they could steal our data from all the country by creating the account. So in our test environment, we limit the, test, the set of data to test to 10 cities with only 10 points of interest per city. So yes, they can steal that. That's fine, we're fine with it. But at least they can test the API and they can see the building value. You're not going to make your business successful by monetizing a few API calls. You're going to be successful if your customers, your users are successful. So we're talking about a big number of calls, not small ones. So don't be worried to offer free test, quota, and access to a few of your data. That's how you're going to convince them to actually really invest in your product. Pricing model. I'm not here to tell you how to do your business or what should be your business model. But I truly believe that if you do public API, you should, it should be simple and transparent. You should remove all the upfront payment to get access to your product. Having an upfront payment is basically saying to people, pay before, make sure if it's good or not. Remove that. For that, the pay-as-you-go business model seems to be quite good. Per API, per packages, depending on your business model, but it's basically, I help you to build, I offer you this test environment where you can test, build, prototype, and be ready to go to the market, and I will make you pay only if you start to be successful. And if you're not, it's fine. That's how you're going to increase a lot your user base. And small thing about the payment method you offer to your customers, it seems that the credit card is the best payment method, but you have to know that big countries do not have access to credit cards. So offer other payment method, like bank transfer, for example. And think about India. It's not easy in India to get a credit card. And most of the time, for the developer database, that's where most of the user might come from. Last point. Eight. Support. Coming to, to about what was said in the first presentation today and the discussion that how should we allow people in GitHub to open issues or not or what should be the support uh, method, that's up to you. But they have to be clear. Your users, they need to know how they can get support, what are the different channels, they should contact you. I strongly advise you, whatever the channel you use, to have a public forum for the tech support. It can be your own forum, it can be Stack Overflow, but I strongly advise you to do it. Why? First, when you answer to one of the users, one of the technical questions, you're actually offering this knowledge to all the community. You make it searchable for every other developer that might face an issue later. So that will reduce, that's going to reduce the amount of support you're going to have. And secondly, you're actually building a community around that. Before, when we started, I had to answer absolutely every single question we have on Stack Overflow. 
Now, if I'm not available for a couple of days, the community is actually answering for me. And that's around the tech support. Public forums. Very quickly, FAQ. Have an FAQ, reference when you have a question that's actually answered in the FAQ, reference your user to the FAQ, keep it up to date. When you see that you have the same and same questions all the time, it means that it should be in FAQ. FAQ can be business, in the industry, be, be, be broad, be right about it. And on your side, monitor everything. You need to find bugs and issue before your users tell, tell you about it. Why? Because when you have an issue, you need to investigate. You need to start fixing. You need to deploy. If you start when the user notifies you, you're ready to wait on the process. If you monitor and you find a bug before, when a user actually finds out about the bug, you are actually very close to fix it on to deploy the fix. So monitor everything and get it In summary, make it easy. Everything is about attracting users and making their life as easy as possible with your product. Be transparent. Transparency is one of the key values for developers. So be honest with them. And last one, think about developer experience. And if you struggle with all of that, get a developer person. That's their job. So here, in every uh, public speaking training, we're going to tell you that's the moment you need to make the call for action. So I can tell you it's time for you to go back to your product team to assess all these points and make sure it's followed. But I think the thing we want right now is to go to it more. Thank you.